we're going to take some time to do a more detailed and slower paced discussion. We're going to talk about the advantages of allowing you to view voltage and current over time and some of the things we can see. Now this type of analysis is going to be required for communications because it's very difficult to diagnose communications without being able to see the actual pattern. And we'll talk about that in communication sometimes. Crank and cam are extremely critical. We can do cam timing. We can look at things. We have a case study in here about a vehicle that could only be solved with an oscilloscope. Fuel system has some high-speed components we need to look at. And, of course, the ignition system is all that important. Almost anything that you can use a voltmeter on, or DVOM, we can use a lab scope. We just get more information. Let's talk about the controls. The big three is range, gain, or voltage scale. Different people call it different things. It is, in fact, the voltage scale. Then there's the time base or sweep rate. That's how quickly we're painting the voltage across the screen. Things that happen very quickly have to have a high speed rate. Things that happen slowly need a slow sleep sweep rate. And then trigger. Trigger is what we use to stop a pattern that has happened at a regular point and make it stand still so we can do a detailed analysis. You saw that done live in our quick demo, so you got an idea of that. Let's talk about amplitude. Pick the range that fits the test you're doing. Right now, we're looking at the vertical scale on the left, the red scale. It goes from zero in the middle to plus five at the top to minus four at the bottom. It's slightly offset, and we can talk about why we do this in a real class on lab scopes. But basically, we're set up to look at a five volt signal, plus and minus. On the red scale on the right, we see five volts and we have a red pattern down there. What you're seeing, we're looking at 720 degrees of engine rotation because we're looking at the, at the cam sensor at the bottom. We're seeing how it has one pulse, two pulses, three pulses, one pulse, three pulses, two pulses. And then it starts repeating itself all over again. That five is perfectly good for that scale. On the top left, we have a blue trace. It is also on a five volt scale, but it has a red warning flag there. That red warning flag indicates the blue pattern is going off scale. We need a higher voltage range. So you have to have one that's high enough. But don't make the mistake in saying, oh, I was expecting a five volt signal. Oh, that signal is too small. I'll make it a two volt range and try to look at an underpowered low, small signal on a bigger range. If you're expecting five volts, have a five volt range or 10 volt, whichever. We'll talk about that and show what the differences are. Here we are, we got a 50 volt scale and we got something less than eight volts. If all we're looking for is the shape, that's fine. We're okay. If we wanted to see more detail, we could take it down to a 10 volt scale. Now it goes from slightly above zero up to 10 volts. Now the advantage of what just happened, let's back up and look at that. Before, it looks pretty close to zero, not quite. Now on a better scale, we can see it's well above zero. It's not going back to zero. What does this tell us? Look at the ground circuit. We're not getting a good zero return. Let me say that again. Our 8 volts may be perfectly fine, but we're not getting down to zero. Is it a problem? No. The computer can read this perfectly. But is the ground voltage too high? Yes. Different subject, it is too high. Sending us to look in a different place for something different. We've talked about grounds and beat them up before, so you understand what we're talking about here. Now, if we go to a 5-volt scale with an 8-volt signal, we're in trouble. It flat tops at 5. We got the red indicator up there saying, hey, you're well over range. But we get a good view that we're about three quarters of a volt above zero volts at the bottom. By magnify it, we looked at the bottom. We didn't care. We clipped the top off. So if you're doing a range change like this and going over scale for a reason, don't worry about it. It doesn't harm anything. It just lets you look at what you want to look at. This is time across the bottom. We go from 0 at the left to 20 at the right. That's seconds in this particular case. 
If we sweep slower, we get little screeny patterns. If we sleep faster, we expand it so we can see things better. Now, either one is fine, except if we're looking for that pendle hump, we're going to need a fast little speed trace like you saw in the earlier demonstration we did. I can see the pendle hump in the faster trace, and I already got to look for it in the slower trace. So here I am looking at a one millisecond trace, and I've got these pulses. Now, this means the screen is 10 milliseconds wide. Okay, that's how wide the screen is. This is a 50% duty cycle. Both of them are squared up. So if I speed the things up, go to higher RPM, they get closer together. Now, the speed didn't change on this test equipment. I changed the wheel speed to make it go faster. This is a digital wheel speed, or it could be an RPM of anything, for that matter, that gives me a square rate pulse. So when I have higher speeds on the vehicle, higher RPM of the signal, I might need a faster trace, but I don't really need a faster trace. This is adequate. Sometimes I want a lot of patterns like this. You say, why would you want to see more? Sometimes more is better. We're looking across here, back to my one, millis one millisecond per division. Everything looks fine. Now if I make it two milliseconds, I get more of them. Now here I didn't change the speed or the RPM of the device I'm looking at. I changed the speed at which... I'm painting the screen. Here is a good example of an actual signal with noise. I wanted to see enough to pick up the noise. Now let me show you noise in specific value. Notice this trace right here is single. It's not a pulse. It's one quick downshaft. There's another one over here. One's going down, one's going up. This is an erratic Hall effect device causing a big drivability problem on a vehicle. We should have a series of square pulses. We have a bunch of halfway pulses, some doing this, different things happening. They get bunched together at times, and we get a bunch of pulses. Now, do I need to spread this out? No, because I wanted to see a lot of pulses to find these extra pulses. If I get it too close, I might miss some of these pulses. In this case, I wouldn't, but take my word for it. There are times you want to slow this down so you can get a good picture of it. If we get too slow, they look bunched together. This is the perfectly normal sweep. This is just way too slow for the signal we're looking at. Let's talk about how we do that later on. Talk about the trigger voltage. This is the voltage level that the signal must cross for the scope to begin writing the waveform. It locks in at that point. We can have a positive slope where it's going from low to high, or we can have a negative slope where it's going from, from uh, high to low. Most automotive signals are repeating signals. That means they happen over and over, and they usually relate to engine speed. Now, that repetitive rate almost never is synchronized to the exact speed of the trace. It looks like it's floating around. It appears to be floating across the screen and going back and forth. You saw that earlier in the example. When we set a trace, a trigger like we did here on this injector, we lock it in and start this quick pulse look at it quickly, and have a lot of empty time. If we didn't lock this trigger in, we would not be able to do this. It would be drifting across the screen, floating across the screen. Here's how trigger works. When we set trigger, we set it to a level. This particular one is a negative slope. It's going to trigger when it's going from a high, which was 8 volts, going down towards zero. It triggers at about 6. If I want to do a positive slope, I'm going from a low, almost zero, up to the 8-volt level. And it's going to trigger when it crosses the 6-volt point. My actual voltage is 5.892 5 volts is where we're triggering. Not that that is super important, but if you just want to know the actual value. So we can do two different things. We can trigger so we get a pulse going up, or we can trigger so we get a pulse going down. When we had an injector, we are going to turn current flow on, we triggered on the falling edge. So here's what we did with our negative slope. We picked this spot here, and when it went down, we started our trace. Now notice that this goes down to zero volts, and it goes up to almost 100. So different things respond differently. We've painted a picture, and we can see everything here, and you can clearly see that little bobble over there where the pendle moves. Some communication signals are not repetitive. They come in burst. Here is a data burst. 
you'll get one data burst. You're never going to be able to lock this in and make them stand still. All we are looking to see is there's a data burst, there's empty space. Data burst, that's more in-depth for the communications class, but just be aware, communications are not going to stand still like our cute little patterns did before. Some things like accelerator pedal position sensors or throttle position sensors, we have dual sensors. We can go and look for fallouts by doing a slow sweep test. This is a 20-second sweep where you open the throttle up, let it come down, and watch both accelerator pedal positions change. Here's a good example of looking at multiple things. We frequently get a question of why do you want to see two or three things at one time? Well, let's go over them at the top. At the top, we have a 3x sync signal off a of GM3800. In the blue, we have an 18x signal for crankshaft position. And at the bottom is the spark timing command where the PCM is sending out signals to turn current flow on and off for the primary. Let me say that again. The spark timing at the bottom turns current on and turns current off. Now there's a specific relationship between these three patterns. We won't bother with the sync signal, but that tells the DIS module which set of plugs to fire. Let's look at the bottom. Let's talk about the importance of this signal. What I'm going to do is we're going to ghost out everything, move those uh, spark timing signals up so you can see how they relate to the 18x signal. Now the relationship with the crankshaft position and the ignition control is easy to see. It's one, two, three. It is exactly three pulses wide. It starts on the leading edge of one and turns off on the falling edge of the third trace after it and does it every time. So who is determining, at this idle speed, spark timing? It is that crankshaft position sensor. It is four pulses. What happens if I miss some of these pulses? Whoa, that could be very erratic. We had a situation with a GM vehicle that had an 18x signal that lost one pulse occasionally, and it exhibited an unusual idle. It sounded like it was jump timing, as the guy said it, when that pulse was missing. We had an erratic hall effect. People had worked on it for a couple days. The only way to catch that one missing signal was to have a lot of things on the screen at once. What's going to happen if we look at a pulse and say, oh, here's the leading edge of a pulse, turn current flow on, count three pulses, when it goes back high on the third pulse, turn current flow off and cause the spark. If we're missing a pulse, I'm going to go way too far. I'm going to go 20 degrees out there before I turn current off. That's greatly retarded timing spark, and it caused a very bad spark now. But it only happened once in a great while. So when we say there's a relationship between crank and cam and spark, it's not some magic thing computed out of the sky. It goes back to these signals. And noise and problems in these signals, like that Hall effect signal, really mess up spark timing. All right. Let's go look at some basic sensors and get back to basic testing again. This was just a preview to give you some information you could use to look at scopes a second time.